thank you for that introduction. Um, it's really an honor to be here, and I want to thank the Nazareth community for inviting me, and, and particularly Yamana uh, for her determination to get me here. I, I, I really uh, am honored to be here. Um, I also want to warn those of you who want to disrupt my talk or disagree with me that a combat marine named John Sheldon is sitting in the front row and he's agreed to be my bodyguard. <laughs> he said already that he agrees with everything I'm going to say tonight. <laughs> and if you have any problems, you can see John and the very large man sitting next to him. <laughs> Good looking out, brothers. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I, I want to, um, I'm, I'm going to focus uh, part of, of, uh, of my talk tonight uh, on the story of, of the company that I wrote my book about, Blackwater, uh, because I think that um, this is a company that really is, is a sort of metaphor uh, for the way that U.S. foreign policy has shifted uh, over the past decade under both the, uh, the Bush and the Obama administrations. Uh, and I, I want to say at the onset that I'm, I'm neither a Democrat nor a Republican. Uh, I consider myself a journalist, and I think that journalists have an obligation to hold those in power to the same standard, whether they're people that you like or people that you dislike personally, because personality doesn't really matter. It's their policies that should matter to journalists. Um, I was telling, uh, telling John before I came up here tonight uh, that it's, you know, I, 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 uh, it's not a secret. I tend to be on the left side of the political spectrum. I write for The Nation magazine, which is one of the, uh, the, the more famous liberal magazines in the, uh, in the United States. Um, but the vast majority of the hostile mail or hate mail I get these days comes from liberals uh, who are irritated uh, with things that I've said or reported about President Obama's policies. And what I find very telling about it is that they're the very same things I was pointing out or reporting about those same policies when they were being implemented by President Bush. And I, I think that, in a way, that's, that's a, a commentary on the times in, in which we're living right now in this country where there's a... Uh, a great division along party lines, and, and somewhere in the midst of all of it, the actual truth of the matter gets, gets lost. Uh, but before I, I talk about Blackwater and the privatization of U.S. warfare and U.S. foreign policy, and to an extent, uh, domestic policy, because we see radical privatization occurring within the Department of Homeland Security, uh, within our airports, prisons, schools, health care, uh, we're in the midst of the most radical privatization agenda in the history of the United States, where we're shifting public money to the private sector in an unprecedented way. We're defunding public institutions and, and pumping with U.S. taxpayer dollars private institutions that are taking over functions that many would argue uh, should be the sovereign realm of nation states or governments or, uh, or public institutions. It becomes very deadly when you do this on the battlefield, and there is not a system of accountability for the private forces that is, in fact, enforced for members of the United States Armed Forces who operate under a very strict legal code. And I'm going to talk about some of that momentarily. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about the current situation that uh, we're seeing in the world, both domestically and internationally. Uh, as you know, and I, I don't know what the latest news is, there's a, uh, a great uh, chance that the government is going to be quote unquote shut down. And it seems like the, the major sticking points right now in the whole scheme of things are absolutely ridiculous when you think about uh, the fact that it could result, if the government is shut down, in U.S. troops not getting their pay, in many public institutions being shut down, <coughs> including places like the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, I mean, it, it, the, the, the disaster that could happen as a result of this shutdown should not be uh, understated. <coughs> And yet the main issues <laughs> that are, are, are centering uh, in this debate are the issue of, of Planned Parenthood and abortion. Uh, that, is, that has become the primary issue. We're talking about $500 million for Planned Parenthood. An organization, the vast majority of the work they do has nothing to do with abortion, as to with preventative health care for women. And yet this is something that is, has, has become so important to some that the government may actually be shut down and all of the consequences I cited, from troops not getting paid to the CDC being shut down, to thousands upon thousands of federal workers not getting a paycheck, mortgages going unpaid, families going without the ability to support their children. If you think about the fact that they're arguing around four or five hundred million dollars for Planned Parenthood, and then you rewind the clock a couple of weeks and look at the U.S. military action in Libya, you'll realize that the first week that the United States was bombing Libya, U.S. taxpayers spent $500 million on that operation. Every single missile that was launched 
Tomahawk cruise missile that was launched on Libya cost $1.4 million. Some fighter aircraft that we are flying over Libya cost $80,000 an hour when they're in the air to fuel and, and to support. So when, when we talk about federal dollars and realize that you can get stuck on $400 million, it's a spit in the ocean. We spend that in a minute in Afghanistan during the war. So, that, so we have politics now that is going to determine the fate of people's lives being used in a very sick and cynical way to push political agendas. And the Democrats do it and the Republicans do it as well. But on this, this issue of the, of the war in Libya, I'm sure that there's division among you about whether or not it was the right thing for the United States to do, to go in there and, and, to, and to attack uh, Libya and to bomb Libya to stop Muammar Gaddafi's forces from moving into Benghazi. The person within the administration, the Obama administration, that was uh, most opposed by all accounts that we have to that military action was in fact the Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates. Two weeks before the United States began bombing Libya and implementing the no-fly zone there, Robert Gates said that he was against the no-fly zone in Libya. Robert Gates also said once the US started bombing Libya that he didn't see any national interest of the United States in that operation. Those are very sobering statements to hear from the Secretary of Defense of the United States when American lives are being put at risk, civilian lives are being put at risk by those bombs potentially, costs a lot of money, $500 million a week, $1.4 million a missile. So for the president and others within the administration to go over the head of the Secretary of Defense was quite a story, and yet you didn't hear much about it. And when, Rob, when, when Secretary Gates testified in front of the United States Congress, uh, unenthusiastic would be an, an understated way of describing his testimony about that operation. But we were whipped into a frenzy and told there was going to be a massive massacre in Libya if we didn't move in to stop Muammar Gaddafi. Maybe that's true, maybe it isn't. Anthony Shadid, the Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times reporter who was one of the four New York Times journalists who was taken prisoner and tortured by Muammar Gaddafi's forces after he was released said that he didn't see any evidence when he was on the ground there that a massacre was going to take place or was taking place. And that he felt that the reports of, the, of, of what was happening on the ground were exaggerated and informed by people who weren't even there. Now, Shadid also says maybe there were things he didn't see. He doesn't claim to have a monopoly on the truth. I don't claim to have a monopoly on the truth. But I do know this. There are far worse human rights abuses occurring throughout the world in dictatorships that have the full support of the United States government and not a peep is raised about them at the United Nations. So whether or not it was necessary for the United States to go in and bomb Mo Muammar Gaddafi, whether that stopped the genocide as some have said, and, and make no mistake about it, Muammar Gaddafi is a loony. He is a crazy person. He, he looks like a, a botched plastic surgery job from one of the bad episodes of The Real Housewives of you know, New York or something. If he had Donald Trump's hair, he could be like some supervillain, you know, <laughs> running around terrorizing people. Um, but let's just remember that 18 months before crazy Muammar Gaddafi became the top pariah in the world, who was over there meeting with him in his tent and shaking his hand? Senator John McCain, Senator Lindsey Graham, Senator Joe Lieberman. And what were they discussing 18 months ago with Muammar Gaddafi? Well, they were talking about U.S. military forces training Gaddafi's forces under the bridge of CENTCOM, the U.S. Central Command, which has oversight of, of Middle East operations. They were talking about weapons deals to uh, provide fighter-bomber aircraft to Muammar Gaddafi's government. So if you're going to start talking about Muammar Gaddafi as a pariah, let's look at who he recently was shaking hands with and call into question why are we engaged in this operation when our own Secretary of Defense is saying it's not a good idea. I think that part of what we see here is a, is a duplicitous application of U.S. policy on a moral scale. Someone like Muammar Gaddafi, when he threatens to hunt people down and kill them, even in their, if they're hiding in their closets, must be confronted, must be bombed, must be overthrown. The President of the United States has stated on the record that Muammar Gaddafi needs to leave power in Libya. The President of the United States dictating to other leaders in the world whether or not they are allowed to be in power anymore. But while all of this is happening with Gaddafi in Libya, you see in Bahrain the corrupt monarchy of the Khalifa family, 
engaged in systematic brutality and killing of nonviolent protesters there. And yet we say nothing about the Bahraini monarchy's treatment of nonviolent protesters, who some could argue were in the streets in greater numbers than those in Libya. The Bahraini government actually went so far as to destroy a monument in, in the center of the capital called the Pearl Roundabout. And it be, because they didn't want a symbol of the resistance there, as Tahrir Square, Liberation Square was in Egypt, to remain. So they went and they literally bulldozed the square, the, the, the roundabout, the circle, where the protesters had been gathering and where the center of their protests were. And the Obama administration said nothing except platitudes. They talked about the need for a political solution. But there was never a question that the Khalifa monarchy needed to remain in place. Why? Well, the fifth fleet of the US military is based in Bahrain. Bahrain is a pliant, the, the, the regime there is a pliant puppet for the interests of the US and the Saudis, the most powerful countries operating in the Middle East. So we have two sets of standards. One is for people that we don't like when they commit human rights abuses, and one is for people that we do like or that we need when they commit human rights abuses. Perhaps the most stark example of this apparent hypocrisy is in the case of Yemen. Now, most Americans could not find Yemen on a map. Uh, I mean, most Americans would have trouble finding their own state on a map, according to certain studies. I don't know if you saw this stuff about, you know, ask, ask, ask a, the average American to, to tell you to, what the Bill of Rights are, and they'll, you know, the head will go into a, into a spin. I'm sure it's different in the Nazareth community here, but uh, I think many people in this country couldn't pass the citizenship exam. Uh, and, and, and when it comes then to, to, to identifying countries on a map, uh, I, I think we're, we're even worse off. But, but many of these countries around the world uh, should be of vital interest to us because of what they represent. Yemen, actually, earlier this year, was identified by the leaders of the US intelligence community, community, including the director of national intelligence, James Clapper, as representing the single greatest terrorist threat to the US homeland. That was the phrase that they used. Because of a group that's in Yemen called Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is sort of the, the, the newest iteration of Al Qaeda. It's probably home, Yemen is, to the largest number of actual Al Qaeda operatives. Contrary to popular belief that Pakistan is the center of Al Qaeda's activities, it, it seems more and more like it's shifting over to Yemen. The president of Yemen is a man named Ali Abdullah Saleh. He's been in power for 33 years. Ten years ago, shortly after 9 11, Ali Abdullah Saleh got on a plane and flew to Washington. He flew to Washington because he saw what the United States military did to the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, toppled them in almost an instant, made mincemeat of the, of the government of the Taliban. The insurgent movement of the Taliban is a different story, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Made mincemeat of the Taliban. <coughs> Yemen was on a list of the early targets that the Bush administration had drawn up to, to, to go after as part of the declared war on, global war on terror. So Ali Abdullah Saleh, who's a very crafty guy, gets on the plane from Yemen, and he flies over to the United States, and he comes over and he talks the talk to the Bush administration. Uh, I, I interviewed the former uh, head of the CIA's Division on Political Islam, uh, who was a participant in some of these meetings. And he said that Ali Abdullah Saleh, the president of Yemen, literally just kind of showed George Bush that he was a good guy that you might want to have a beer with. And said, you know, we're with you against terrorism. And, and, and Bush literally embraced the man and said, good to have you on board. And they started training his military to fight for the purpose of fighting Al Qaeda in Yemen. It's the ancestral homeland of Osama bin Laden. It, it shares an enormous border with Saudi Arabia. It is the place where the underwear bomber, uh, Abdul Farouk Abdul Mutalib, uh, was trained and sent, where the recent parcel bombing plots were, were hatched. It's also the home of Anwar al Awlaki, who is a US born uh, Yemeni cleric. Uh, who is known as sort of the YouTube jihadist. He makes these videos and scares Americans. And um, you know, it's the politics of the boogeyman, power of nightmare stuff. And I'll get to that in a moment. So uh, this guy, Ali Abdullah Saleh, a ruthless dictator, corrupt, pilfering money all throughout Yemen for, for 30 years, becomes a good friend of the United States and becomes the recipient of a tremendous amount of US military aid. And basically what, what he did is he convinced the United States, every time he said Al Qaeda, that they needed to give him more money. So the Bush administration starts pouring money into, into Yemen, and they build up all of these Yemeni units, uh, special operations units. 
And part of what was happening there was also that he gave, the President of Yemen gave permission to the United States to go into his country and to kill people, U.S. Special Operations Forces, to go into Yemen, a country we're not at war with, and literally do targeted killings there. Um, the first drone strike that happened outside of Afghanistan was in November 2002 in Yemen against six people that were suspected al-Qaeda members, one of whom was a U.S. citizen from Buffalo, New York, named Kamal Darwish. Uh, that was the first strike that the U.S. Uh, carried out outside of the battlefield of, Af of Afghanistan. So Yemen has been a central part of the U.S. counterterrorism strategy almost from the beginning of the, the launch of what, what the Bush administration called the Global War on Terror. What happened, though, over the past 10 years is that the president of Yemen, the dictator, has taken U.S. weapons, U.S. Humvees, U.S. helicopters, and most importantly, very sensitive training from U.S. Navy SEALs and other special operations forces, and he has used those forces and those weapons, not against al-Qaeda, but against his domestic political opponents, to crush rebellion in, inside of his country against him. And the U.S. has said almost nothing about it. President Bush was silent on it. President Obama has been silent on it. In a way, what President Obama has done regarding Yemen is even worse than what President Bush did. Because when the, the dictator of Yemen in March started authorizing his forces to conduct targeted assassinations of nonviolent demonstrators, the Obama administration was silent and, and, and at times said that they continued to back the president of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh. Why? Well, in December of 2009, <coughs> General David Petraeus was sent to Yemen by President Obama. And, and they hatched a deal where when the United States would bomb in Yemen, the Yemeni government would take responsibility for the bombings and would say they are our bombs, meaning Yemen, and our military action, and not yours. That month, in December of 2009, the U.S. carried out two Tomahawk cruise missile airstrikes on Yemen and killed a tremendous number of civilians. In fact, they've only been able to identify one individual connected to al-Qaeda that was killed in those two strikes. Important tribal leaders were killed. Civilians were killed. It was a source of tremendous outrage in Yemen. And yet, what happened was that the Yemeni government took responsibility for the operation and lied to its own people and said the bombs are ours and not yours. Now it's been confirmed after the fact that they, of course, were US bombs because the Yemenis don't have Tomahawk cruise missiles and they don't have submarines to launch them from. So what we've done there is we've propped up this dictator who has convinced us that he's against al-Qaeda in the name of fighting terrorism, and instead we've turned him into a client who is probably the single biggest terrorist in Yemen right now. The vast majority of Yemenis want him gone. Millions have poured into the streets, and yet we hear nothing but silence from Washington. If you look at that situation, and you just Google around and read what's been happening in Yemen, and then compare it to what happened in Libya, and you look at the way that the Obama administration has responded to them, it will tell you a lot about US foreign policy and the double standards. But I actually don't think it's inconsistent. I think that's how US policy has been implemented basically forever. It's, it's very consistent. When someone is inconvenient to US interests, we take them out. When someone is convenient to our interests, we keep them in. But the problem here is that the dictator of Yemen isn't actually convenient to our interests because what we're doing is giving al-Qaeda or anyone that wants to rise up against the United States or its allies in the region a very good motivation to do it. The US is killing civilians in yet another Arab Muslim country. The United States is backing unpopular dictators in yet another Arab country. And so it's a great recruitment tool. There's no good option for the United States in Yemen right now. If, if, if the U.S. man leaves, there could be chaos in the Civil War. If he stays, there could be chaos in the Civil War. Either scenario is very good for this tiny group of al-Qaeda operatives that are in Yemen that do not represent an existential threat to the United States at all. Anyone who talks to people in the intelligence or the military intelligence community that has worked on the al-Qaeda issue will tell you that there is no existential threat posed by big al-Qaeda or by al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Do they have the ability to take down an aircraft? Yes, they do. We certainly saw what happened on 9-11, and we saw how close it came with the underwear bomber uh, on, on, on that Christmas day. But they don't represent a threat to our existence. So what is the best approach 
to try to confront that kind of threat? Is it to support dictators and to do targeted killings? Some argue that. Or is it, as one defense intelligence agency analyst told me, to drain the swamp, take away the motivation to do it? What if we had a totally different approach in the Arab and Muslim world? One that wasn't based on the idea that we can kill our way out of the problem. That if we just find every terrorist and kill them, it's going to go away. That, that would mean that we lived in a totally different society with a totally different Congress and a totally different set of war planners. But I would put forward that unless we start moving more toward taking away the motivation for terrorism, what we're actually doing is giving it a reason for being and keeping the swamp full and murky. I saw this firsthand in Afghanistan when I was recently there. I went to Afghanistan this time in October and November with a colleague of mine, and we didn't go and do the typical embedded journalist tour of Afghanistan. See, let, me, let me tell you what kind of happens with journalists when they go into these war zones. First of all, war is boring, um, which is something that, uh, that, that maybe sounds like an odd thing to say. War is overwhelmingly boring. War is you, you're waiting around. I'm talking about it from a journalist's perspective and to, a, to an extent from a soldier's perspective or a Marine's perspective. You spend a lot of time smoking cigarettes, waiting around, sitting in a hotel or on a forward operating base or in a fire base somewhere, uh, and then all of a sudden it goes from that to boom, a bomb goes off, someone shoots at you, you're in a firefight, you're being ambushed. And it, and it literally happens when, when you're, you're not expecting it. But in Afghanistan, <coughs> in Kabul, the capital city, where most journalists are based, it's just kind of like a party. They hang out in bars and hotels and their private security guards. And it's just, it's debaucherous. It looks almost at times like a frat party. It's journalists and diplomats, and they're hanging out, and they are kind of living it up. And yeah, it's sort of dangerous, and it's danger chic, you know? And, 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 and they're there, and they're, and they're getting fat in a war zone, and, they're beca and their livers are getting swelled with, with the alcohol that they're drinking in their bunker buster bars, where they're down below the ground. But then mean, meanwhile, everywhere else outside of, of Kabul, <coughs> Is, is mayhem, and there's a real war going on. But most journalists are in Kabul with the party. And then you'll see them up on the roof, and they're saying, you know, well, Jim, uh, today there was a suicide bombing here. But meanwhile, they just, they, they came, they left the bar to come over to do that report, and then they go back to the bar after that report, and they were nowhere near where that bombing happened. So what, what we did when we went there, we, we, went in the, we went to Kabul, and then we immediately left, we flew into Kabul, and then we immediately left Kabul, and we went, into areas of Afghanistan that are controlled by the Taliban. And the reason that we did it is that we wanted to interview people that had uh, been targeted in US special operations night raids, uh, where civilians were reported to have been killed that had no connection to the Taliban at all. And in order, in order to do that, you can't travel with US military forces. You have to go on your own. So we grew beards. We, wear, we wore shalwar kameez, uh, the traditional garb. And we traveled in the most beat up Toyota Corolla that we could find so that we could blend in as, as well as we, as we could. Um, I'm gonna tell you what happened when we did that, but I wanna back up for one second to Kabul. So when, when members of Congress go over to Afghanistan, most of what they do is go to Kabul or they go to forward operating bases where there's a TJI Fridays or there's war with a cappuccino. And they're shown the dog one day and the pony the next day and they come back and they talk about the progress that we're making in Afghanistan. And let me tell you, it's, it's incredible in some parts of Kabul. Women without burqas, women wearing makeup, movie theaters opening, everybody's got a cell phone, they're texting each other, girls are going to school. If you just hung out in Kabul, you'd think, oh my God, we've made so much progress in this war. And it's true, it's true. In certain parts of the country, really small parts of the country, that is true. So that's why you hear the reports of how much progress we're making. But you go away from there to reality. You go to the areas where the war is actually being fought, where it matters, where the Taliban are. Where the, where the majority of, of, of the people are ethnic Pashtuns, the huge base of support, by some estimates 40% of Afghanistan, behind the Taliban. That's where the actual story is, and that's where most journalists and, and Congress people do not ever go. So we went to those areas. And we went to a, a, a village um, outside of the city Gardez, which is in Paktia province, uh, which is in, in the, very close to the Pakistan border. And when we went to, uh, down to Paktia, we had to negotiate safe passage with various tribes to get from point A to point B. And, and, and in a way, the story unfolded um, of how crazy this war is as we traveled down. 
What we learned by negotiating safe passage for ourselves with, with various tribes is that these, these tribal leaders play both, the, both sides of the coin. One day they're with the Taliban, the next day they're with the US forces. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. If the United States wants to get its, its supplies into Afghanistan, they have to come in through Pakistan. And they come in in huge trucks. And, and they drive them all across Pakistan, and then they drive them all, they come in by boat, they go into the port in Karachi, they're driven or they're taken by train all the way through Pakistan, then they cross over to Afghanistan, and then from there they go to the various US bases. In order for the US to move all of its supplies through both Pakistan and Afghanistan, they have to bribe the Taliban to get, to get safe passage for it. I think your mind can start to work on what I'm getting at here. So we're paying the Taliban or the Haqqani network uh, or potentially members of Al Qaeda for the ability to safely bring our weapons of war through Pakistan and Afghanistan to kill those people. So we are funding both sides of the war. So we're, we're, as we were negotiating our own safe passage, we meet this guy Haji Shelkat in, in the province of Logar, and I'm talking to him and he is missing one of his fingers and he had fought in the Mujahideen War in the 80s against the Soviet Union. <coughs> And he had become a very rich and fat man. And he had just bragged about how he took on his third wife recently, which was a status symbol for him. And we started sort of chatting with him. And he, he knew a little bit of English. And he was very proud to be talking to us. And so he tells us his story. And basically, he runs a private security company that is nothing more than a racket. And what they do is they broker deals with the Taliban not to attack on Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, his days of controlling the road. And then the Americans pay him a lot of money. And he gives a fraction of it to the Taliban. And the Taliban stay away those days. But on the other days of the week, the Taliban can attack whatever convoy comes through. Maybe it's the Germans, maybe it's the British, someone else. Go ahead and attack them. So, so then the Taliban, they take the money that we've given them, and then they buy weapons so that they can attack the convoys on the off days. So we're funding, funding both sides of the, of the war. The other thing that we notice as we start driving down uh, you know, to go deep into the Taliban territory is that you have what appears to be very secured roads by the Afghan security forces. They have their police checkpoints. And you, know, you stop at them, and they, they have sort of their nice new uniforms that the US has given them. And they look in your vehicle, and some of them have the little like dent gigantic dental tool things. You know, dentist puts it in your mouth to see the back of it. They put them under the car, and they're making sure there's no bomb there. And, um, and it all looks, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a show. It all looks effective. And then you realize that at 3.45 in the afternoon, every, all the Afghans you're around say, you know, you should probably go indoors right now, because the Taliban come and take over those checkpoints at about 4.30. It's like a changing of shift. So the, the, the US-backed Afghan forces control the checkpoints during the day, and then the Taliban uh, control the night. You know, they're like, they're like Trump on The Apprentice. They fire at night. So they're, they're, uh, they're there manning these checkpoints, and then they're not, and it's the Taliban there. And the Afghan police literally run away from those checkpoints at about 3.45, like <coughs> clockwork every day. And then the Taliban take over. And the Taliban tell the cell phone tower providers to shut down the cell phone service or they're going to blow them up. And the reason they do that is because they don't want anyone to give intel about their movements. They literally control the night all throughout this huge swath of Afghanistan. So we traveled through that and, and went to this village. And in this village was the scene of, of a horrifying incident. Um, it happened last February. Um, there was a, uh, the US Special Operations Forces were given intelligence that there was a uh, Taliban suicide bomber that was being prepared to go and